As we get close to the end of 2021, this special episode, episode 226, is a Stark Hangout, or what I'm calling a December Stark Patron Reflections. It's a roundtable of myself and four awesome patrons of this podcast, just talking about writing and the craft of writing and the business of writing in general. So welcome to this special Patron Reflective episode. Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 226 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. This is a very special episode, and uh, the introductory stuff's going to be relatively short because this is over an hour. It's about an hour and nine minute long conversation that I had on December 22nd, 2021, with four of the awesome patrons from this podcast. This is a roundtable discussion about some of the craft, some of the business, just some of the bits about writing life. And I want to call these special episodes, I'm going to call it my um, reflective, uh, what the the heck was the term I came up with? (laughs) The uh, Stark Patron Reflections or Patron Reflections, uh, part of the roundtable. I I really love the idea of just kind of throwing some ideas out there, which is what we did. Uh, Sherry sent some great questions and and we all chatted. So you're going to hear from later in this episode, you're going to hear from Jeff Elkins, Maddie Dalrymple, Sherry Dechterhurst, Kathy Mack, and myself. So uh, Jeff and Maddie and Sherry and Kathy are four of the patrons for the podcast and they showed up at the Hangout that I did this week uh, just for patrons. We recorded the chat. The video has been posted to the patron uh, channel so you can watch the video there as well after this goes live the video will be available for anyone else uh, to view if they want and i just thought this was just such a fascinating conversation and what i loved about it is this was meant to be a treat for my patrons but it was very much a treat for me i got to hang out with some really cool people and talk writing stuff and so that's what's coming up in this episode This special episode of the Stark Reflections podcast has been sponsored by the awesome patrons of the Stark Reflections podcast. Thank you so much, patrons, for your sponsorship. It means so much to me that you're willing to sign up and be willing to share on a monthly basis, either $1, $3, or $5 a month. It actually means a significant amount to me. You have no idea uh, how much that impresses me, how much that uh, warms my heart every month uh, that you guys are so generous and thinking about me and I appreciate your support and I really hope that the content I'm providing you and that extra content you're getting as patrons is valuable. I know on top of the intrinsic reward that you feel. So again, just a special shout out and thank you to the awesome patrons of the Stark Reflections podcast. Your patronage really does make a difference. And of course, you do not have to support the podcast via Patreon. One of the best ways you're supporting me is right now, by listening. You can also leave a, a, a review on the podcatcher of your choice, because that also makes a huge difference. Or share this podcast with someone that you think would find value in it. So that's it for my thank you to my patrons and for the introduction. I just wanted to, I'm not going to reflect at the end of this episode because I think the reflections of um, myself and uh, four of my awesome patrons who are guests in this special episode, I am so happy and thankful for the opportunity I had to chat with them. And so uh, you, dear listener, there's only going to be one week left uh, in this uh, podcast for the year 2021. This episode is going out you know, sort of like December 23rd slash December 24th, like it's depending on what time zone you are in. Uh, And it'll be the second last episode of the year. I've actually already pre-recorded 
what's going to be going out on the 31st as I get ready for the new year. But that is it for the introductory blather for this episode. Let's jump right into this wonderful patron reflective podcast. Hey guys, welcome and thanks for hanging out with me today. And it's okay, mics are open and, and everyone can chat. This is just a fun hangout with some really cool writer peeps that I'm I'm actually, I'm, I'm pretty excited that I just get to hang out and chat with you guys for, for the next hour. But for some formalities, uh, if anyone wants to just introduce uh, who they are and then we can, I guess people join us later, we can introduce uh, people. Okay, uh, fair enough. Uh, Kathy, I have dogs and issues going on too. So I will uh, honestly, um, that when Liz gets home, you're going to hear it and I'll try and mute my mic. <laughs> the dogs will go ape shit. Uh, <laughs> but my name is Mark Leslie Lefebvre and I'm the host of the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing Podcast. And here are just a few of my awesome patrons hanging out with me, sharing their reflections, chatting about the love that we have uh, of the business and craft of writing. And uh, over to my left, I have Jeff. Uh, Jeff, do you want to share... Uh, uh, hey, I'm Jeff. I am a fiction writer and uh, I do the Dialogue Doctor podcast. And oh, I have a fun story. About three years ago, um, I was having an existential crisis as a writer and I reached out to Mark um, for coaching and help and his advice kept me writing. So oh I'm actually God. here Not and only the Dialogue Doctor. And Dialogue Doctor, dude. Mark, yeah, because <laughs> Mark uh, kept me in the game. Uh, which oh, is, that is fantastic yeah wow and and look at how many people you are helping every week that is amazing <laughs> helping we'll put that in quotes no 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 are you kidding me are you kidding me dialogue i'm gonna leave a link of course yeah. to the dialogue doctor so people can check it oh, out thanks. if they have not yeah <laughs> all right and below you i have i have another podcast host i have maddie dalrymple hello i am maddie dalrymple i write the Ann Kinnear suspense novels and suspense shorts and the Lizzie Ballard thrillers. And I also podcast, write, speak, and consult on the writing craft and the publishing voyage as the indie author. Cool. There'll also be, of course, a link to the indie author in the, in the notes for this. Yeah. <laughs> That's exciting. Okay. And Kathy Mack, who did say she was going to be sporadic because there's dogs coming in and out of the house at all hours. <laughs> The door is right there and they just they just yeah it's it's freezing rain outside so you think they would stay in but oh no they're gonna want to go in and out um my name's kathy mack that's my pen name i teach creative writing at st thomas university in fredericton and jeff i have sent many students to your website oh <laughs> thanks and and maddie i have sent many people to your to your um blog so oh, cool. it all works out thank you um so I am primarily a poet and huge on editing and on revision. So, uh, and I stumbled across Mark's website when he did a, an article for the um, Writers Union of Canada. Remember that article all those years ago? Yeah. And, uh, um, and I've been wow. hooked on his podcast <laughs> You know, you've got that on your conscience too. You've got this entire writing mafia across Canada and the world. And it's, and it's yeah, all down to Mark. That's and now my dog wants back in again. Can you hear him scratching at the door? Right. So I'm going to go do that. <laughs> and it's a perfect segue over to yeah. Sherry, Dr. Hurst. Hey, Sherry. Hi, Mark. Uh, Merry Christmas, everyone. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, I write historical fiction. I've been a uh, a uh, client of Jeff's, and he's helped me through all kinds of interesting uh, dialogue dilemmas. Um, <laughs> that uh, I've been a, a, a patron supporter of Mark's for, I think, from almost the very beginning. Yeah. Uh, and uh, love uh, the blog, Maddie. I uh, read it all the time. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm sort of trying to get my um, uh, stories to have more of a suspenseful twist, and you've uh, given some great advice. So thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you that's so fun to hear i i love that this is just this is just a love-in of 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 people who are engaged in the community and wanting to help others and interact and connect it's phenomenal uh all all talented writers all talented people not afraid not afraid to share and comment 
Um, I want to, I, I, this is going to be open discussion because it's, I mean, I get to pick your brains. This is going to be such a benefit for me, but um, Sherry sent uh, so some questions ahead of time. Sherry, do you want to read them yourself or should I read them? Like what's the, uh, you can, you go ahead. Yeah. Okay. All right. So uh, the, the first question uh, I'm reading mastering plot twists by Jane Cleland, uh, excellent craft book. And she emphasizes the, uh, emphasizes the importance of establishing a strong narrative question, the question or theme that drives your book. My question is, I'm writing a two-book series. Should I consider three narrative questions, i.e. one overarching uh, for the series with two sub-narrative questions based on the theme for each individual book, or two distinct narrative questions and no, no overarching theme, or one overarching theme for both books? One, two, three. So first of all, I'm making a note of that book because I want to go check it out. <laughs> so, Jane Cleland, Mastering Plot Twists. And that is such a great question. Um, I, I want, if everyone is willing, you don't have to, but uh, I'd love for, for your take on it. I'm going to start off with, I, I, I kind of think you need three overall. I think you need one per book. That's what my approach would be. I would want one per book, right? For the story arc within each of the books. And then potentially one one large one for the series, uh, whether whether it goes on more than two, um, and that and maybe that question changes. Um, so that's sort of my thoughts. Uh, feel free to to jump in, guys. Whoever wants to sort of share their thoughts on this, Maddie. I think three also, and I was just thinking in terms of my own series. So I have. Uh, one series, the Engineer series, that uh, in both the cases, I didn't know they were going to be series when I started the first book. So when I was writing the first Engineer book, I thought it was going to be, um, you know, Engineer gets in trouble and gets out of trouble, basically. And then when I realized that it was going to be a series, then each book clearly has its own arc. And um, Anne's arc is really just her evolution over time. One aspect of that be, uh, is that she becomes more comfortable with her own ability, which is that she can sense spirits. But it, I haven't planned out, like, hopefully I'll be able to write, you know, dozens of, of Anne Kinnear suspense novels. So I don't have in my mind that at the end, I want Anne to be such and such. I'm just kind of following Anne along in her progression as a human being. And then each story has an arc. And then for my other series, the Lizzie Ballard thrillers, again, when I wrote the first book, I didn't realize it was going to be uh, more than one. And so I had one arc that was Lizzie gets in trouble, Lizzie gets out of trouble. And then I realized when I was done with that, that she might have been out of that trouble, but there was more trouble <laughs> that she was in as a result. And so it became a trilogy. And I had to kind of uh, rethink what I wanted that, you know, I wanted each book to end with a certain resolution, but setting it up for the larger arc. And then the third one, wrapping things up in hopefully a nice way so people weren't expecting more. I really recommend the Engineer series, by the way. I've read several of them. They're really Thank good. Thank you. Yeah. And the dialogue is exquisite in it, right? It is. Matt is a great <laughs> dialogue writer. It really is. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Maddie, you made me think because you're talking about the like series and, and stuff like that. I was trying to think of a series that has an overarching question and then one that comes to mind. Michael Connolly's uh, Harry Bosch, which is the uh, everyone matters oh, yeah. or nobody matters. Yeah. Or no one matters. Um, and, and I know he's kind of, Harry's fading off into the distance as Renee Ballard, it, not Lizzie Ballard, Renee Ballard is taking <laughs> over in that series, but the, it still follows the same premise, I think. I'd love to get an opportunity to ask Michael Connolly that, but that would be an interesting question. Yeah. Um, uh, so who, who else? Uh, thoughts on the, on the questions and I mean, there is, it does feel like when you're going to like, maybe it's just a genre thing, but when you're going to like the, you know, genre, like the Lee Child-esque Jack Reacher genre, I don't know that there's an overarching question for that series. It feels like every every time Jack Reacher shows up as the exact same. Will he ever replace his toothbrush? Yeah, that's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah will he ever meet someone as strong and powerful as he is um but yeah but there's I, you know so i don't know and i think um i think there's some literary fiction that have no overarching question but i don't know that people enjoy reading those so i that's i kind of I, I think it's um i think it's 
I don't know. I think I, I see some places where like, but then Reacher has a, the Reacher novels have a, a question for every novel, right? Like they're right. mysteries in a sense. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know. I'm just musing. I don't actually have a point. <laughs> well, I'm curious well, about what, what, what are some of the, some of the literary titles that you think don't have that sort of question? Um, I think about um, the Golden Finch feels like it has it but then as you end the novel it doesn't um because she doesn't actually donna tart doesn't actually end the question she kind of throws the question away because the question is like what happened to this painting and you find out at the end that like oh the painting's been gone for a long time like it's not really (laughs) it's not a big deal um yeah so i think of that one that like has a question and then just kind of tosses it out at the end um but i guess you could say for that one even the overarching question is kind of like what's going to happen to this kid um who's been through this trauma so maybe it does as well um maybe it's that they have them and they're i'm just not satisfied by how they're answered um yeah i think of like i think the classic one is like the sun also rises that seems to have no you know the question is kind of like what's happening with this dude jack and the answer is <laughs> potentially nothing like that's kind of yeah so um but it's well i don't know <laughs> yeah it is it's i love it it's one of my favorite books it's beautifully written um yeah i don't know would anybody push back and be like no those have narrative questions and jeff just missed them i'd have to go back and read them again to i feel like they do but i it's i i don't it's been a long time since i read the goldfinch and um I'd have to go back and read it again. Yeah. By the way, I love that book too. So it's not, a, it's not a, um, it's not a criticism. It's yeah. just a, no, I get it. It's, it's been a long time since I tried to read. The- <laughs> but I like the goldfinch. There's but- as many writing styles out there as there are people. Some people are deliberately trying to not they're trying to contravene convention, right? They're trying to not do what the books do. So they set up a question and then they set up another question and then they set up another question. And by the time you get to the end, you've sort of lost sight of what the first question ever was. Yeah. Uh, unless, And sometimes they'll bring it back to it and that'll be nice and sometimes they won't. I don't really have an answer for you, Sherry, except um, another thing that I found out on Mark's podcast was uh, Jay Thorne's and Zach Bohannon's um, three-story method. So if you do decide to go with a third story, then that would be a fantastic resource for you, right? And there's a dog that wants in. (laughs) Yay! There it is. Product placement. I think another storyline that kind of uh, goes against the traditional arc, the traditional overarching arc, is that I finally watched, um, oh my gosh, what's the the series with uh, Helen Mirren being Jane Tennyson? Do you know what I mean? From back in the 90s? Yeah. Um, Anyhow, it'll come to somebody in a moment or I'll Google. But that one, okay, okay, spoiler alert for anyone who wants to go watch it and hasn't watched it yet. But (laughs) Prime suspect. Prime suspect, thank you. Google Um, Google knows all. (laughs) Every episode, you know, of course, has, has is wrapped up. I mean, not necessarily optimistically wrapped up, but wrapped up. And then Jane just has this downward trajectory through the entire series, you know, the multiple seasons and you, you're kind of waiting for it to somehow be redeemed. And then the last episode happens and she's not redeemed, you know, and I think it would have been not true to the story if anything else had happened, but it was also like, you get to the end of the last episode and you're kind of like, oh my God, you know, that just... (laughs) It's pretty clear, you know, her, she's heading into retirement and her life is now over. And you can't imagine that, you know, in a year, maybe Jane Tennyson's going to be around anymore. It's but brilliantly done, but you know, it was a, it was a shocker. Yeah. I got myself in trouble with this question with the series. Cause I was, I started writing a mystery series, the adventures of Watkins and how, and I was like, I'm going to do four of these. And for each book, I'm going to add a mystery. So in book one, they do one mystery. In book two, they do two mysteries. In book three, they do three mysteries. And then I got to, I, I've been trying to write book four for a year and a half, and I can't oh figure out God. how to solve all four mysteries. <laughs> so, 
Yikes. <laughs> so yeah, I will say like playing with this too much kind of froze me a little bit. Uh, <laughs> you could cheat and just have one of the mysteries be, where did I put the teapot? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Something you could probably fix like that. that one pretty fast. Yep. Well, I was um, uh, showing Liz some of the Spider-Man movies she hasn't seen yet uh, in, in, in light of the latest Spider-Man film. And, and we got to the third Tobey Maguire Spider-Man. And one of the problems with that, it's like the worst movie in the entire Spider-Man <laughs> universe. Um, but it, it has some great elements. Like it's got Flint Marco, Sandman, and it's got uh, James uh, Franco as, as the son of the Green Goblin, who becomes the Green Goblin, which was a major storyline in the comics. And then you have Venom, which was another significant, gigantic storyline. And it's almost like they, I, I don't know if they realize they're not going to make any more movies. So they just crammed three plots into fun. one. <laughs> Like it, it, each one of them could have been a significant villain. Um, you know, Flint Marco being very, well, obviously they're, they're all somewhat sympathetic uh, in their ways, right? They, they all have some sort of, you know, they're not in, in inherently evil. They may, may, maybe went insane or whatever. But uh, that was one of the things that I thought was interesting. It was almost like that, that four mysteries that you're talking about, Jeff. You're like, it's like, well, I'm just going to cram four mysteries. Yeah. In here. <laughs> Just don't have it. Just don't have them like going down the street doing the weird, uh, you know, um, the um, uh, the strange dancing with the, the black the, hair. Yeah, with the black hair the wrong direction. direction yeah. stuff like that. It's like this is an embarrassment. Yeah. They, All they, of a sudden, it's West Side Story. They can do it in Batman. They can do it in in Spider Man, right? Yeah, that's true. That's villains? true. How many villains? How many villains can dance on the head of a? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so Sherry, in in terms of the series that you're talking about. Are you interested in, uh, and, and I'm not, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I am. Uh, are you interested in talking about the potential questions you have per book or for the series? Because I think that might be a fun, <laughs> a fun thing for us all. Yeah, it, again, it's historical fiction and it's set uh, in uh, 1920s in New York City. Okay. And um, the, the, the question that I was had, or sort of one of the themes which seems to be a recurring thing in all my books, is just sort of what is family, right? And uh, uh, so uh, Lucy, who is the, the protagonist, is a very young woman, uh, early 20s, who grows up in an Italian-American family. Um, and I'm, because it's historical fiction, doing all kinds of great research on the and what it means to be a second generation Italian American and, and uh, you know, some of those pressures, of course, you have gender issues, ethnic issues, religious issues. And of course, like all good books, she gets pregnant uh, out of wedlock. And um, what does that mean? And so this family who has always meant sort of loyalty and security and love uh, throws her on the street. And uh, uh, again, so the, the first book will go to the point where she finds out she's uh, pregnant. And then the second book is what happens after that. And then, Jeff, you'll know she winds up in Pony Gulch, Montana. <laughs> but anyway, another story for a different day. Uh, so so I'm, I, I was thinking what I would do is take that idea of family because there's all those different kinds of pieces to it. And, you know, one book would be it an exploration of um, sort of loyalty and what that means to, you know, all of her brothers and sisters and her parents and her aunts and her uncles and this very large extended uh, family and some are loyal and some aren't loyal and what does loyalty mean and all that kind of stuff. And, and then the second one would be security because that's the one where she's the insecure, uh, most vulnerable and uh, how that sort of winds up. So, so I'll, I'll I'll try and come up with some big, uh, profound questions. Uh, uh, but I really uh, like the advice of three because I was sort of leaning in that direction anyway, because that'll be the bridge that ties it together. But uh, as you say, uh, Maddie, there'll be a, um, um, a question that's asked and answered in each book. Right. I love, I love that. I mean, I wrote down as you were talking, because I'm a visual thinker, I have to see little charts. And I wrote, what is family at the top? And then I had like two little lines diverging, like a little triangle thing. What is loyalty? What is security? And it's, it's like, okay, that's the overarching questions that is going to keep coming up. But here are the specifics. 
Um, I love that. Um, I, I, I'm not, and I'm not a, I'm not a plotter. I'm not, I'm not someone who does a lot of that pre-work, but I love the fact that you've got this in place or you're at least thinking about it already. Yeah. I always thought it'd be interesting to find out from historical fiction writers who are plotters and who are pantsers because you can't fudge research. Uh, you know, if you're writing a contemporary novel, then you can speak from your own experience in, and that. But, but you know, by gar, if you don't know what that 1923 uh, rifle is, and was yeah. it there in June or was it there in September? Uh, you know, like yeah. the, I got into a great discussion about when a particular movie had come out as a talkie, because uh, I happened to mention in the book that you know they were listening to it and uh you know like it's it's amazing what um real buffs of of history uh sort of fixate on so uh anyway it's uh thank goodness for internet and google and and this wonderful world we live in where we've got instant access so that's yeah. that's why i spend so much time outlining is that you know to try and identify what some of the big unknowns are going to be in terms of research uh let alone plot and those kinds of things and then as i get started writing i've got to start plugging in the the idiosyncrasies of of you know kinds of beer sold in saloons in montana in 1927 <laughs> so it, it's funny you talk about that because uh, you do that for history and obviously you're going to get history buffs who are going to be very much no that didn't come out till june and this book was set in may what's what are you talking about willis that kind of thing and so i had that in in the last book that i released because it's only set in july of 2017 but i first of all have to know what the weather was uh, yes because if the guy wakes up outside uh is is he going to be wet or is it going to be dry is is are you going to be able to see the moon or not that kind of thing and then even little things like I had a, a character who referenced uh, really loving a Taylor Swift song. And I had to make sure that that album had come out because <laughs> yes. I'm going like, yeah, it's out now. It's been out for years, but that was 2017. There are little things like that that are constantly like, oh, wait, that movie hasn't come out yet. Uh, even and I did reference a movie and it was like, oh, no, that only the first in that series of movies came out. So I can't reference anything that happened. So I caught myself several times. A, having to double check. Well, and, and then historically, you know how you can check historical maps on Google too? Mm -hmm. He's like, was that business there? Did that business, yeah. did that restaurant exist? When did it open? And so I'm checking. I end up spending, I probably spent 30, 40 hours minimum over the course of several months going back and double checking places. And oh, I can't have that restaurant. It doesn't exist yet. Yes. Yeah. His, historical societies uh, are a real godsend. Uh, you know, they're usually run by um, either very underpaid staff or volunteers. Mm -hmm. And the, the amount of, of research that they've been able to help me with, with things like, you know, what was the name of that store at that location at that date? And who was the owner? Because I need to include that in my story. And, and you know, it just amazes me the stuff that, you know, they come back with the name and the deed and archival photographs and, you know, little interesting tidbits from an oral archive that they just happen to have squirreled away. And, uh, uh, you know, you really rely on uh, these people for, you know, keeping you uh, on the straight and narrow in terms of the writing. Although I have to say, I think it's in Harriet Vane in one of the Lord Peter Winsey novels, says um, that when she has a book come out there, she tries to make it as, as correct as possible, but there are invariably mistakes and people will write to her and she always writes back to them and says, thank you very much. I will correct it in the next edition. And she never. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> If they ever allow me to do an next edition. Well, yes, exactly. that, that strikes me as interesting. So Sherry, you're talking about all this research that you're doing. And I know we've all had to do that research for, for books. Is, are any of those tidbits that you had to do research for, but you ended up not? Because it was, a, it, I, I, I fall down the rabbit holes. It was like, wow, this was fascinating. I'm not going to use it in the book, but oh my God, this was fascinating. Is, are those tidbits that you give to your readers, like in a newsletter? Or, or have you guys leveraged uh, that in any way? Um. I do uh, 
author's notes at the back of my book for the stuff that's included in the book. Okay. Um, then um, I have uh, a blog on my website where all kinds of things go. Uh, that I, The book I'm just working on right now is about Chinese prostitution uh, in uh, Montana in the 1920s uh, and some incredible uh, stuff related to that in terms of research and underground tunnels and, and mm -hmm. racism and all kinds of things that is only coming out now um, uh, just in the last five years or so because of archival or uh, archaeological digs and things. And uh, so that uh, some, some of it goes to my uh, uh, newsletter people and some of it goes up on my blog and some of it gets squirreled away for future plots. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's cool. great to have that like persistent content to keep readers engaged over time. Like mm -hmm. such a huge benefit to be like the, you know, have, cause I think one of the things I know I, I'm only really capable of two books a year. Like I, I know other people write super fast. I can't, I just can't. Only um, two books a year. Only, yeah, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so that's um, having something to like pass on to your readers like that is really cool. So keep them engaged in between the books. What, one of the places that I used in um, Pony Gulch, uh, which is a fictional uh, mining town in Montana based on a real town, was a store um, that was so recognizable in the description uh, uh, that someone purchased it and then wrote me to tell me that all the archival photos that I had up on my website were just so invaluable and they were so excited and they were going to restore it. And, you know, where did I get all that information? And so I put them in touch with the Montana Historical Society. Like it was like reality and, and, and you know, your imagination colliding, you know, in real time. It was just uh, so amazing. <laughs> I love when that that sort of thing happens because think about think about that engagement that you have that has come out of the pages and is now in in a, in, in a multi dimensional way where people I, that that to me is is some of the hidden power uh, of of that of what what we're doing which is, which is amazing that that must feel really cool obviously or or when someone writes and says hey I noticed this one thing and they either ask you a question for more details or maybe they go is that true or did you make it yeah. up <laughs> yeah well and of course i use um um uh, his uh, real uh historical characters as part of the background like the president and all those kinds of things uh and some of the the people that populate the town are real as well and um i had someone who was a relative say you know we always knew about you know aunt jenny and we didn't know this about her. Uh, is it true? And I was able to, you know, pass along a bunch of archival uh, news clippings that I had, you know, sort of said, yeah, <laughs> she cool. ran a speakeasy. <laughs> she was a gal. <laughs> That's cool. Reminds me, uh, Lincoln and the Bardo, uh, reading that was uh, an amazing, well, actually listening to the audiobook was a phenomenal experience because of all the voices. <laughs> he was like a gigantic cast. But um, it's amazing how it's based on real events. And so you know that these events happen, but obviously the, the wisecracking or fighting ghosts that are having conversations while he's going into the cave to hold his dead son. And all of it, like, it, it's just, I'm always fascinated at where, what was obviously the ghosts were a product of the writer's imagination, but what, what are the, like the dialogue and the pieces, were those actually documented from, you know, our research? And that always fascinates me. Uh, I, I had that same experience. I know it sounds funny, but with um, Lincoln, the vampire hunter, right? Because you've got the reference to something that happened in his childhood, which did that lead to his desire with the emancipation proclamation and, 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 and these little, to threads and, and his son did die of a wasting disease was it a vampire bite <laughs> like, like like these are the things and i know it was completely fantastical but i looked at it and the, those both of those made me want to read more about lincoln and his life and stuff like the, that. the most powerful uh question uh, an author ever has is is what if yeah i'm doing that right now with catherine the great or the great on hulu 
It's a, oh, yeah. a, you know, every time an episode starts, it says a, an occasionally true story. <laughs> so I'm constantly like at the end of an episode, I'm constantly Googling. I'm like, okay, wait, what, what's, what's real? What's not real? What happened? What didn't happen? Yeah. Yeah. yeah with Catherine the Great, I mean, a lot of it probably was real. <laughs> <laughs> she was a character. <laughs> yeah. And it is, it is interesting to find like, you know, earlier we were mentioning like little things like a gun or like you know was that gun here or was that movie here like it's interesting to see like oh yeah that little small detail is actually true the the plot is completely fictional but the small detail is real and yeah. that's as a as a as a consumer though that's all i need i just need that detail and i i feel totally immersed in history i'm like oh it's real yeah but 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 the detail allows you to buy the mundanity of the of the, of the situation so you feel mm -hmm. grounded in it so you can go and alien showed up right <laughs> it doesn't yeah. matter right <laughs> um, yeah they call it they call it verisimilitude right so it's i i always remember that word because it's it's very similar to reality <laughs> verisimilitude <laughs> yeah <laughs> I like that. I, when we were watching The Crown, the first couple seasons of The Crown, Liz is sitting with her laptop and Googling like mm -hmm. news reports of, yes, the queen went there. And yes, this is what happened when all those miners died. And yes, this we even uh, we watched the parallel of the original broadcast of the Christmas address and oh. then the acted one. And I was so impressed with just how brilliant the actress playing the queen was in mimicking everything. It was like I just, it, it, it just the attention to detail like that just blows my mind. My wife and I did that exact same thing. We <laughs> watched it with Google open on the, on the side. You and a million other viewers. Yeah. Um, but thank you. This this is awesome. I love you. This, uh, but but Sherry uh, had uh, sent another question that I thought would be fun for us to round table. Um, and, th and this is this would be great for all of us, I think. So Sherry also said, "I'd love to hear about your." you um, and others planning processes. See, she was already wanting to do a round table here. Um, as we hurdle towards 2022, I'm trying to pull all the creative hopes and dreams into a manageable plan of action. Any advice? So planning, we're at the year end, we're all kind of, this is often a time of reflection where we go, okay, what did I get done? What didn't I do? What, what, <laughs> what is still on the agenda? Uh, anyone want to start by sort of talking about how do you approach that? And and, and where do you take it? I mean, especially one of the things that it's difficult to plan for right now is I'm going to an in-person writer conference. Well, you know, it's hard to plan for those things right now. So I've been, uh, I try not to only do this at the end of the year because it feels so artificial. But one thing I've been working on for years probably is is what can I do to get more time for my fiction writing? Because, uh, you know, I'm making more money for my fiction writing than I am from anything else. And it's what's going to carry me forward. Um, and so I'm just getting to the point where I'm starting to bite the bullet and pay people to do some of the things that I'm really not adding any value for. So I got someone to um, do final edits on my podcast transcripts. And um, that's saving me quite a bit of time. But I am sort of at the point where I want to, uh, I'm just about to call up my financial planner and say, I need to rework my finances a little bit because I feel like I don't want to get into a situation like I'm going to start a restaurant and I'm going to make a sandwich and then I'll sell the sandwich and I'll have a profit of a dollar and then I'll buy some napkins. You know, it's like no one runs a business like that. And I feel like I've been resisting I've been doing that a little bit with my writing and publishing business. And so I feel like at the beginning of 2022, there's going to be this little spate of me spending money on things like, let's have a professional write my book descriptions for the online platforms. Or, you know what, I really don't need to be doing all the posting on social media. Let's get somebody to, to help me with that. And I'm still very much sorting through how to do that, but I feel like it's important for me to bite the bullet financially in the short term to get some help with those things somebody else can do so that I can spend more time on the things that somebody else can't do, like writing my fiction. Um, so that's been really, I mean, people who are listening to the podcast are probably sick of hearing about this because I'm always sort of moaning and groaning about this, but that's something I'm really hoping to attack at the beginning of 2022. 
I love that. Thank you for uh, thank you for sharing. Um, what makes it artificial? Is it the fact that yeah, we just decide that this year ends, this year begins? Yeah, yeah, because I think it's an excuse sometimes. You know, you'll be in October and you'll have a good idea, and then you'll think, yeah, in a couple of months, you know, when it's the new year, I'm going to do that. And and sometimes, you know, you I think people force themselves into doing. You know, the fact that everybody starts exercising in January and then isn't exercising anymore in February is is a good. Yeah. representation. I think sometimes people either uh, force themselves to do something they shouldn't because it's January or right. um, push off something that they should be doing because it's only October. And so I think it's it's important to be thinking of that in a more holistic, like year round kind of sense. Anyone else to talk about sort of that year end sort of planning? Do what I do. <laughs> Don't do what you Just do. Don't do what I do. No, I'm totally stalled. I'm I'm very stalled and have been for several years. I'm I I think I'm going to retire at this time next year. I have all these dreams about what's going to happen in retirement, which everybody tells me doesn't happen. You know, like everybody gets more busy when they retire, and I can see the potential for that. But I do have I I like one of my ideas was a blog called Retired to Write. Only it would be, it would first say two with the two crossed out and the re-added in. So it's too tired to write becomes retired. To write. <laughs> that's that's what I think. Uh, I like yeah. that. That's very oh, clever. I like that too. Don't do what I do. <laughs> just if you're doing anything, just keep doing it. Like that's the big thing, isn't it? Get your yeah. button in the chair or standing at the desk or wherever it is, and just do the work. But you but you teach writing, right? You help students. You I do. So I. Teach uh, I how do you give that up or do you? Oh, it's hard. And I'm not sure I will. I think that I'll try to keep teaching, but not in a extended, you know, 14 week term, right. that, that whole thing, but workshops and, and, uh, and short courses, I can see doing that because I do love teaching. I love, um, I love those aha moments, you know, when, when somebody gets it or I, or when, when one student starts explaining something to another student, I go, yes, they get it well enough, they can explain it. <laughs> it's great. But, um, but I have found that my own writing has suffered just, just, just due to the fact that there's not enough hours in the day. It's the same problem that you were having, Maddie, that, you know, you're doing things that don't necessarily really need you to be the one doing them, right? right. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, yeah. and I also think that the whole concept of retirement is kind of, uh, becoming outmoded because I think that more and more people are just recognizing it as, you know, you, you hope you do this kind of work for a period of your life because you need to pay the mortgage and save up money and put kids through college or whatever that is. And then at some point you get to, you get to make the decision about what you want to do independent of the need to earn that money. And so um, I think that you know, people of this era, when we retire, we're going to be in much better um, shape than like my friend's parents who the dad retires and they think they're going to play golf all the time. And, you know, that's not really a viable way to spend one's life. But if you can stop teaching because you need a paycheck and instead you can teach in any scenario you want to, independent of whether you're earning, you know, earning a buck for it or not, that's, that's a pretty cool place to be. I'm a, I'm a pretty, I kind of come in from a different vein. I'm a pretty obsessive planner. Um, I have massive spreadsheets that I update at the end of every month and said, so January, December, this time for me, like I'm actually not putting out any dialogue doctor stuff for two weeks um, because I'm just planning. Uh, so I did a podcast on Monday. I didn't do a newsletter this week. I didn't do a bonus episode. Oh, I did do a bonus episode, but it was just kind of random. I didn't do, I won't do one next week. Um, and part of that's because I'm taking the time to kind of like figure out what my goals were. So for me, um, I, if you're into the Clifton Strengths Finder, I'm a, my top in my top five are strategic context and achiever. So like, meaning that like I look to the past to understand the future and I need a plan and I need a goal to achieve. So like, I look at like, okay, what did I accomplish last year? 
what needs to be maintained and I'll set goals around like what needs to be maintained. So like last year I did 50 podcast episodes. Um, that's, that seems like I'm not going to do more than that, right? One a week is all I'm going to do. And I'm going to take two weeks off during the year. So I, that goal just carries over. Like that just needs to be maintained. Other goals, like I have goals for my income. Like this is how much I made last year. Um, that I'm going, I'm going to try to do kind of a, you know, big, hairy, audacious goal. Like we used to talk about BHAGs, like we used to talk about in, uh, in production management stuff. So, you know, I'm trying to tenfold that, which is a big, huge goal, which is like, I don't know if I'll hit it, but I do it with my writing too. Like I track monthly word count. I'm like, okay, this is how many words I got done this month. And so I set a goal for myself every month. I'm like, this is the number of words I got. And the way I build those is I go, I actually set out like, okay, these are the books I want to write this year. And then I work backwards. I'm like, if I'm going to publish this thing in May, like I have my next novels coming out in May. And I was like, if I'm going to publish that in May, when does it, when do I need to get it back from my editor to do my final rant, to put it into all of the, you know, wide places that I'm going to throw it. And then, you know, how long do I need to give my editor? So that's when I need to have my draft done. And I'm going to, I want to have another, I, I just, became a three-story method certified editor and one of the other certified editors is going to do that with me so i was going to read it for me so when do i need it to have it to her she's going to take 60 days so then that's a benchmark so i'm like okay i have to have my draft done by this day to get to all of those other benchmarks where i start like passing it off to team members and then it's like okay so how many words a month how many chapters and i actually don't typically think about words per se, I think about chapters. So it's like, how many chapters a month do I have to write to get here? And if that's the number of chapters a month I have to write, how many chapters a week do I have to do? Uh, I don't do days because days stress me out, but I will do, cha- I will do weeks. So like right now for December, I, I've got to get five chapters a week done to get to my, to get to my goal for my editors to start taking it and running it. Um, and so that's, you know, that's, I, I'm just chunking it out, right? Like I know by Saturday, I got to have five chapters done. I've got three done this week. So it's like, okay, I got, I got to do two more. And I have a spreadsheet where I tick them off and like, <laughs> I'm looking at it. It's over there. I have a spreadsheet where I tick them off. And um, as I tick them off, I, uh, I, you know, if I, I have the due dates on there and then I can, uh, I pass by them and it, it feels really good if I can get ahead of them. So like, that's always my goal is like, can I get ahead of my due dates? That always feels great. So, but I set all of that up in January. So like right now, right now at the end of December, I'm setting up both books. I've got one book set up till May. The other book I'm hoping to publish in in October. And so, um, and then I have two dialogue doctor books in there too. So it'll be four books total this year. Um, And I have, I'm chunking all of them out of like, what's my production schedule for all four of those books to get them out on these artificial deadlines that I've set for myself because, you know, I indie publish, nobody's actually waiting on these things. So it's it's like, how do I, but yeah, so I'm a pretty intense planner. I start off and I do it. I take this week from like, thankfully I have a day job that kind of closes down during December, during the end of December to January, we work with a lot of universities and a lot of military contracts and they're all getting their like PTO, like the military is all getting their PTO in so they don't lose it. So, they, <laughs> so all of those clients disappear. And then all of my university clients are like off for a Christmas break. So I don't, I don't have any, they're doing finals and then they're like disappear. So things just kind of like slow to a halt during the season. So it works Thankfully, my day job allows me to be this OCD weirdness of planning um, to, to, uh, to actually like take a week and like pull this crap off. But yeah, that, but it, I think it's all about what drives you. Like that drives me, being able to like sit down at the end of every week and be like, did I hit my goals this week? And then taking like three hours at the end of every month and going through like all of my stats, like what did I sell? What, what came out? What went in? you know, what books gave away Are any books like popping, like did anything surprisingly hit somewhere? Um, and then, uh, and then like think through like, okay, if that's starting to hit, like maybe I need to add to that series or maybe I need to like put that somewhere or like, do I, is that a wave I can capitalize on? 
nine times out of 10, it's not. So like that kind of like, you know, just churning around goals is really helpful for me. I, uh, I just recently had to come to a, a decision, a difficult decision. So I, I'll often invest in something because if I've invested in it, I'm going to get it done. Right? I'm going to drop this amount of money or put up this pre-order or whatever, because I worked a deadline. And uh, Teachable is cute because a couple of years ago, I think it was after NaNoWriMo, and I bought this whatever access to this major you know, professional package or whatever, thinking I was going to get a bunch of courses up. I didn't. So I threw 800 US dollars away. And then last year I went, well, if I, if I, if I put it in, I'll get it done. And I went gangbusters at the beginning of the year, putting together this um, uh, additional course, three quarters of the way on this one, three quarters of the way done on that one. And, and then the teachable thing came up and I, and I went, no, fortunately I've been getting rid of credit cards and, and, and low, when, when I get payments down, I lower the cap. So I can't, so constantly there's no credit available, which is perfect. It's a great place for me to be. So, but then I get the notification that they tried to charge me. I'm like, Oh yeah, I forgot that it's just going to auto charge me. And so I went in and I sat there and, and made the difficult decision and said, you know, the last two years I thought I was going to do this and I didn't do it. And it goes back to my favorite writing uh, mantra is uh, if the act of writing or if the desire to write is not accompanied by the act of writing, the desire is not to write. So I thought, why don't I just listen to myself? Maybe I'm not going to get it done. Why don't I do it this way? I'm not going to commit the $800 again. So I, I canceled it. But what if I actually go and finish the courses, then I'll pay for it <laughs> so that I can make yeah, maybe make sense. some of that money back. Because I mean, yeah. the money coming in from Teachable was <laughs> was not making up for the $800 uh, on that. And so that was one thing I did this year that's different than I normally do where I, I set deadlines. I have three pre-orders set up uh, for next year already. Uh, one uh, collaborative fiction uh, title uh, that is, is going to be a really fun project to work on. I was supposed to start working on this month, but we we both agreed to start in January uh, and a nonfiction book. That's been a, a, the passion, the big, big passion project, which is my, my ode to planes, trains, and automobiles. <laughs> the, the, it's just a trivial book about planes, trains, and automobiles. Cause this is the book John Candy was reading in the book and, and it never existed. And I thought I'm going to make this exist. It'll be a trivia book uh, about the movie. And, and I, and <laughs> I've actually, it's, it's half written, but I put the pre-order up for next October uh, which is Canadian Thanksgiving, so that it's out in October, it's available for American Thanksgiving. And then I put up a pre-order for another nonfiction book on accounting uh, for authors that uh, D.F. Hart and I are writing together. Um, but then I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it, and this is normally where I would think, what are the things I want to do? Well, two of them are collaborations, so I can't monkey around the way I normally monkey around, but they're also the pre-orders are up, so I can't monkey with them. One of them is a book I've wanted to do for four years. I had the idea years ago and every, every time October rolls around and I start thinking Thanksgiving in, in my Canadian way, I think, oh, I should do this. Well, I actually started working on that book in the summer, but realized there was so much more research. I found the original script from Planes, Trains and Automobiles. So there's deleted scenes and all kinds of stuff that I found out that is like, no, I got to dig further. I can't just, I, I can't. And so right now I'm thinking about what are the other books I want to write this last year, at least two books I released. I had no idea I was going to write them <laughs> until stuff happened. Uh, Joanna and I, for example, with the relaxed author, we didn't ever plan on that. And, and the experience of being able to say yes to a project that I had so much fun and I got such intrinsic reward out of, I want to make sure in my planning and I always do stuff I never plan, but I want to make sure that I plan for being able to say yes to a project because like, oh, I'd love to do that. I don't know if I can because I've already maxed myself out. So my planning, and, and again, it's the 22nd of December as we're recording this. So I really hope I have some time to actually sit and just chew on things uh, for, for several hours. Uh, and I may be doing some travel uh, the last week. So that may be giving me an opportunity to say, okay, instead of putting a podcast in my head or an audiobook in my head, I'm just going to sit and think for a bit and maybe make some notes. Um, and so I'm, I'm hoping, uh, I don't think those three books are going to be enough to satisfy me uh, in the way that writing a, a full-length novel satisfies me. <laughs> I, don't know if, I don't know if you guys 
get that feeling where you don't have that? Yeah. I think so much of like the planning techniques we use or like how we build stuff has to do with like, like you're saying, like, you know, understanding ourself and playing off of our strengths and weaknesses. Like part of the reason I'm such an obsessive planner is because I know I have crazy brain and like without a plan, I'm jumping from like one book to the next. I'll be writing like five books at a time and none of the books are going to be quality because I'm like jumping all over the place. So if I don't have like a schedule, to like having that, like the reason the planning works for me is because I have to have that uh, to like make sure I stay on track. And it sounds like Mark, part of what you're saying is that like deadlines work for you because they keep you like, you know, disciplined. It, it yeah. sounds like if you owe somebody something, it's going to keep it. So like a pre-order is like, oh my gosh, I, I owe these people this thing yeah. or like collaborative writing is like, oh, I have this other person who's dependent on me. Yeah. So I have to keep like focused on keep yeah. moving. Or a yeah, deposit think, with an editor. Okay. And, yeah. their, and their window is this. And if I miss yeah. it, too bad yeah, for yeah. me. That's helped me in the past. Yeah. But I think it's all about like yeah. figuring out your planning and how you plan is all about like, under self-understanding and you know understanding what it's gonna do to force you to keep your butt in that seat <laughs> Fair enough. those words yeah. yeah all those approaches just i'm almost having an anxiety attack just hearing about them so maddie you want to see my spreadsheets i'll show you all of my <laughs> spreadsheets i have such so, such great spreadsheets color oh God, when was the last time i got an offer like that <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I come up and see my spreadsheets. <laughs> I hey. can do all that for my nonfiction and marketing and admin and stuff, but I cannot do it for my fiction. <laughs> like planning out to that level for fiction, it just doesn't work for me. Yeah, I'm finding this this year is going to be really different for me because I I'm a prolific fast writer, so I easily can write five books a year from beginning to end, no problem. Um, and, which is great if you're trying to do a rapid release or you've got a whole series and you go back and forth and tweak and bring everything into line. And uh, at a few months ago, um, I decided, no, I'm going to write books sequentially. So I will start a book and then I will write it and then I'll publish it and then I'll start the next book. And I'm looking at my plan and there's all this white space. And, and I'm like you, Jeff, like, I want to fill it in, right? You know, I want, you know, because, you know, I was saying, oh, it's going to be at the uh, developmental editor. And it's going to be like six weeks. Oh, I could start another book. And I said, no, Sherry, <laughs> you don't start another book. So, you know, now I'm beginning to think, well, okay, so what am I going to do? Well, I can pre-write some blog posts or I'll, you know, pre-schedule Facebook posts or, you know, those kinds of things. But it is it's terrifying almost to see all that white space thinking, and where does the money come? You know, that, uh, um, you know, because of course, one of the advantages of doing five books a year is that you've got a backlist that is always continually, you know, chewing out nice little steady stream of revenue. So that's going to slow down a lot. And so it's kind of, a, it's, it's a big deal for me this year because it's a different four. Wow. Interesting. Wow. Uh, this is so cool, by the way, I have to say, just talking about our different processes is very, very <laughs> beneficial. We had, uh, Kathy, you had a, a question you wanted to hear everyone's take on. We've got roughly maybe about eight minutes, according to my clock. I want to keep it close to an hour. We started a couple minutes in, but do you want to ask the question? or? Yeah, I, I was just interesting, um, interested in the tension between deadlines and editing. Because uh, I read a lot of stuff, um, I download a lot of digital books, and I get so upset when I read a story that I think I can, I can see how fantastic it could be. And it's not there yet, you know, um, because, they, because they, they published it too soon. And quite often, I think that's because they've set themselves a goal and they're going to publish by a certain time. Right. And, uh, and and they don't, you know, so the, so the work itself, I feel like it suffers. So I'm, I'd, I'd like to hear you guys talk a bit about that, that tension. Can I, can I clarify what you, what I think you mean there? Yeah, and sure. it's not that it wasn't copy edited or line edited or proofread. It was that there was a developmental issue in the story. 
both all, all all of those kinds of editings quite often okay. a developmental issue but sometimes it can just be something as simple as um uh bad proofreading or uh, unrealistic you know you know where the where the character's language changes from from scene to scene so right. so you know they're stylistically there's a problem there right. you know, well, that's the, the dialogue is not it needs uh, needs to visit the doctor <laughs> right it come needs, see me yeah it needs more editing yeah. I actually just faced this because I was on, for the Antinor books, I had a goal of two Antinor books a year and I had gotten one out last October. I got one out in April. I got, uh, and I just wanted to get one out this past October and I was really struggling with it. And eventually, you know, in like September, I realized that that, that wasn't going to, you know, work. And I had the appointment, the, you know, the book time with my editor and, um, I usually only do one edit. He does uh, the developmental editing that he does. I can usually incorporate. So he's doing kind of developmental ed editing, but he's also calling out stylistic things. Mm -hmm. And so I think that he, uh, he read it in October. I had to reschedule with him. It turned out, it worked out well for both of us. So I got in touch with him and I said, I can give you something at the date that we originally talked about, but you know, it's going to be sketchier than I had hoped. And mm -hmm. so it worked out well for both of us to push it back. We pushed it back a little bit. And I got his, his comments back and I was incorporating those. And I thought, oh, well, December, definitely I'll be able to get it done by December. And it was one of these things because of the nature of my plots that like pulling one thread was making something else unravel. And so to fix this, I, I was going to have to fix a whole bunch of other stuff too. So it really started snowballing and it was all good stuff was all clearly making the story better but it was taking much longer and so um for the first time I've had to schedule a second edit with my editor because it's going to be sufficiently different that you know I need a impartial professional uh set of eyes on it again and um so I did make I mean I am driven by deadlines to the extent that I did book the time in January with him to take another look at it but I was while all this was going on I'm also talking to a friend of mine who's uh, traditionally published and is also on the same two books a year uh, schedule, except you know what, she can't change it. You know, if, if I get to November and my book's still crappy, I yeah. can say, you know what, I could publish a crappy one this month, or I could publish a good one in two, three, four, I don't know. Yeah, I'm guessing probably March, maybe before it'll be out. And I'm going to be feel so much better <laughs> about my book and myself. Because I had the you know the intestinal fortitude but also the the like contractual ability to make that change for myself and um yeah i think that any time when one lets the the uh, date drive the delivery and not the quality drive the delivery it can be painful for the author and the reader yeah um a friend of mine Catherine bush her first book um terms of engagement won all sorts of awards so her sophomore book, she got a big contract from a big publisher and uh, had to work to a deadline. Didn't like the hardcover version. This was about 18 years ago. Didn't like the hardcover version. So she actually revised it and the, um, the paperback, which came out a year later is pretty, it's got some pretty major differences from the, the from publisher the did that. That's very they, interesting. They, they I've they never heard that same, before. They use the same templates typically for hardcover and trade. I papers. think she insisted she was wow. really unhappy. <laughs> like she was not happy. Wow. Wow. That's yeah. interesting. That's Especially. a good publisher. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It was. I, I, I had, I, I had uh, issues with one and, and even between print runs, the publisher was like, Hey, yeah, yeah, maybe it's not worth the extra work. Cause again, they don't, they're on to the next project. They're not worrying at all. Yeah. That's a year old. Who cares? <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes, I guess, well, you, you've got to have a lot of trust in your editor. I mean, they're, uh, the good editors will give you, uh, you know, tough, frank advice uh, and suggestions. And I mean, even after the books that I've written, I mean, the last developmental edit I got back, I had to stick it in the bottom drawer and like, gnash my teeth for about three months before I was finished being angry at 
their obvious uh, stupidity of not <laughs> seeing the brilliance of my plot and characters. And uh, again, I mean, if, if I hadn't had that long history with that developmental editor, I probably would have ignored a big chunk of what they said. And, and I'm like you, uh, Maddie. I mean, the book will be better uh, now that I'm, I'm coming at it again with a, a different set of eyes. But uh, that, that level of trust, I mean, I think uh, young writers, uh, early writers, they, they want somebody to say that they're brilliant. And then after that's happened in, uh, a few times and you've maybe stubbed a toe or two, I mean, you recognize that sometimes, you know, tough love is probably the way to go. And, and I, I always appreciate hearing it. Sometimes I ignore them, uh, like all good writers do. Uh, you know, what do they know, right? They're editors, they're not writers. Um, but uh, but he hearing that, I mean, it's, it's thrown my whole schedule off because now I'm in the sequential kind of thing. And so I can't start another book until I get this other book finished. And, uh, you know, or, or my, my little nascent, uh, you know, one month uh, um, um, resolution to do books sequentially, I'll throw out the window, you know, right at the very beginning. So, so that's another thing that I'm finding very difficult is because I, I get really excited about the next idea. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in fact, my ideal job would be just to churn out ideas for other people to, to write because, you know, you, I can see them all. And uh, um, so it, it's, it's tough. It's tough uh, that, that uh, tension between deadlines and editorials. Sherry, I, I experienced that with the last book where when I got the feedback back, I was so emotionally invested that I actually had to take three weeks of let's just put it here until I yep. can actually look at it and think about what was said in a way that is not confrontational and not me being defensive, but me actually seeing what needed to be changed. And that I had to push the, I had to actually push the release date and risk yep. myself with Amazon because that was my one hit. Uh, but uh, otherwise, uh, I was not going to have something that I felt proud of. But I needed, I needed the time to digest what I needed to fix more than I needed the time to fix it. <laughs> if, if that yes, makes any exactly. sense, that's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And 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 and, and, and again, because then I can go thank you, uh, rather than damn, you don't understand, you don't get me. You're like yeah. I'm a teenager, and you're my parents. Right? That kind of thing. <laughs> what do you know? <laughs> <laughs> that uh, that actually had, when I think about it, the very first published poem I got published in a periodical called Active Victoriana out of University of Toronto. They sent it back to me and they said, we really like this poem. We'd like to publish it, but you have to drop the last two lines. And I spent the weekend storming around my apartment saying, those are the, you know, everything's in there. That it's, you know, that it's all, it has to be there. And then on Monday morning, I sort of put my hand over the last two lines and went, ah, crap, they're right. <laughs> <laughs> totally didn't need to be there <laughs> and who wants to eat crow like that right <laughs> oh, well, apparently i do because we keep going back right <laughs> yeah i think for for me i'd throw another thing in is the tension because for me the tension isn't between the writing and the deadline um and i i you know i also don't struggle with editor notes and i think part of that is i'm so new to writing i've only been writing for seven years um, and so I assume I'm wrong. Like I, you know, I get a no back. I'm like, oh, you clearly know more than I do. Um, so uh, I, yeah. And sometimes that's to my detriment. There's notes I've gotten back that I should have been like, no, that's, they're coming. They don't see what I was, I'm trying to do here. And I may not be doing it well enough, but, um, you know, deleting it or taking it out isn't the right action. I just need to reform it some. Um, but the other tension for me has always been resources. Uh, so like, you know, when I started writing, part of what drew, all, drew me into indie writing, indie, indie publishing, was that I found that I could do most of it for free. Um, because, you know, because of life choices my wife and I made, we both worked jobs that paid very little and we had five, we have five kids. And so like, there was like most months of my, 
thirties, I was like trying to figure out how to pay the mortgage. Like I was literally like living on a prayer. Like I just, I pray that we money falls from the sky somewhere so we can actually like pay the mortgage on our house and keep the lights on. And so writing indie publishing for me was like, oh, this is something where I could use this weird skill I have in storytelling and hopefully generate some income in a way that won't cost me anything. Cause like Microsoft word, I could write in because my works supplied it. I could upload that word document to KDP and I could like, you know, MailChimp, I didn't have any readers. So MailChimp was super free for me. And the friend, like, yeah, I could sit on a newsletter for free. I could put my butt in a chair once a week and do that. Um, but I will say, you know, I've published 11 novels and my first nine, uh, I didn't have the money for editors. Um, I was like bartering and trading to get things done. And none of them are to a place where I'm proud of. Like they all have, like I had some, a reader email me just last week who was like, Hey, I, I blew through all four books in your first series. And she's like, what are you going to write the fifth one? I'm just kind of like, eh, it's been four years. This is not coming. Uh, so, <laughs> but, and she was like, I, I love it. It's great. There are some typos. And I'm like, yeah, like I couldn't pay for a proofreader. Like I didn't have that. I didn't have, I didn't have 50 extra dollars, much less, you know, 1500 extra dollars that would actually cost to get that thing proofread. So for me, the tension has always been between like editing, like the quality of the work and what I can pay to actually afford um, what I can pay to put up. And I think um, it's a weird tension in our world because there's, there's this beauty in indie publishing that it's like opened the gates to everybody right? Like people, I, I never, I, when I started writing, I was in my, my mid, late thirties. Uh, I had no pedigree for writing. You know, I was dyslexic. I have a master's degree in theology, not in English. Um, I don't know anybody. Well, now I do, but back then I didn't know anybody in the author world. Like there were no connections. There was no networking. I couldn't go to conferences. Like I got young kids and I'm, working crazy hours like there's no like going to a conference to meet people so somebody like me getting an agent is like a zero to zero chance like it just wasn't going to happen but you know i can sit and crank something i can read books on plot and i can that i checked out from the library and i can sit at my desk and late at night and crank out a story and then i can get that story on kdp for for a percentage of potential sales in the future and like that's that was the that's the beauty of indie publishing is that it opens the door to so many people that couldn't have gotten into traditional publishing um the downside is though is that like you gotta have those resources to put out a quality product like when you start thinking of it as like a business and these books as assets that you're putting out of the world you've got to have those resources to get those team members on board whether it's relational resources or financial resources to to put that stuff into the world it's um it's a that's always the tension that i've walked is like how great do i want to make this like right now my my first series the covers are okay they're outdated they're old it's a good series i think if i could actually get it in front of people it would sell i got to redo those covers but i'm looking at my bank account i'm like i don't I don't have, you know, 800 extra dollars sitting around to pay somebody to redo the covers to the level that I want them done. And it's just that weird, like, that's the tension always for me. It's like the quality of the project yeah. versus what I have to invest in it. Yeah. Wow. Fair enough. Guys, I, I want to thank you so much. This has been, actually, I love this. This has been absolutely so much fun. Amazing. Thank you guys so much. I thank want you. for listeners, uh, I'm going to go in the backwards route to the way we introduced ourselves to please share uh, with, with our listeners uh, where they can find out more about you and your books, et cetera, online. Sherry, we'll start with you. Sure. Uh, website is SherilynDector.com and it's spelled S H E R. Y L N D E C T E R. Uh, and uh, everything's up there. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. And Kathy? My best bet is the somewhat outdated website, Kathy Mac Poet .ca, or dot com. Dot .ca, one of those. Anyway. I'll check and I'll uh, put the yeah, proper thanks. link in. Okay. <laughs> Me? Am I up? Yeah. 
Uh, if people want to find out about my fiction work, they can go to maddiedalrymple.com, and that's Maddie with a Y, M-A-T-T-Y. And if they'd like to find out about my nonfiction platform, that's the indie author, uh, dot com, and that's indie with a Y. Consistent wise, <laughs> and Jeff. I uh, my fiction is at jeffelkinswriter.com. Uh, I got a Vela going right now. That's a weekly horror comedy called Nerds. If you're um, in RDS, if you want something that I'm writing currently, uh, but you can find all my back stuff there too. And then the Dialogue Doctors at dialoguedoctor.com. Uh, and there's a podcast, weekly newsletter, bonus Patreon episode, Slack community that's super active, all that stuff. Awesome. Yeah. Guys, thank you so much. This has been an absolute pleasure. Thanks, Thank Mark. You, Mark. This is awesome. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomtech.com.